Hi, um, my name is Dr. Peter Kay. This is the last um, lecture in this series on the internal combustion engine. Um, if there's any comments or queries, then um, please see my contact details, which are on the screen here. Or uh, come and see me. Okay, so as I said, this is the last um, uh, lecture in this series. And in, in, in this lecture, we'll be looking at engine performance and the metrics that we can characterize that. Um, if you haven't seen any of the previous um, videos, please go and watch those first. Um, it'll make a lot more sense as what we're talking about in this one. Okay, so in particular, in the, this lecture, we're going to be talking about um, engine performance metrics. So um, the engine performance can be measured in sort of different ways, many different ways. And um, we're going to define each one of those, um, how they can be used. Um, and then also how they vary with different engine conditions. Okay, so firstly, how can we measure um, engine performance? Well, as I said, there's a range of ways that we can do that. Um, the first is torque, um, which you've probably heard about is, you, you know, a common uh, me mechanical engineering term um, to talk about um, the, the amount of work that can be done on a shaft. Power, um, well, we've obviously heard of that. Um, mean effective pressure, which you may or may not have heard about. This is um, basically a way of expressing the work that can be done in, by an engine, which is independent of the engine's volume or displaced volume, and we'll talk about that in um, more detail later on. Volumetric efficiency, we've already mentioned that in the lecture on the gas exchange, but I'm just going to mention that briefly again here because um, it is important uh, you know, in the whole context of engine performance. Um, mechanical efficiency, um, kind of uh, self-explanatory. Um, specific fuel consumption, um, so this is how well the engine converts um, the energy supplied by the fuel into into power and um, also fuel um, cons uh, convert conver um, fuel conservation efficiency sorry fuel conversion efficiency okay so torque and power um, these are perhaps the most common ones and probably because that they're, they're um, the ones that we can directly measure and the way that they are measured is usually with a, a um, dynamometer. So the way that this works is, here's a schematic of a, a dynamometer here on engine dyno. So the engine shaft is connected to the rotor of this device. And as it rotates, it is um, so a retardation force is applied. Now that can be um, electromechanically, hydraulically or even just by mechanical friction and the the the, the braking force that's applied uh, to the rotor by the stator um, th that creates a <coughs> resisting force in here and by measuring the force at this lever arm B um, and we measure that force um, through a load cell is a modern way of doing it um, we basically tune the um, the so the torque that is being applied over here is if you remember torque is um, force times distance so it's uh, the force that's being exerted in the load cell times the length of the lever arm um, which is B so we can see that up here um, and from that we can get um, the power or the brake power um, which is t um, basically the torque times um, divided by time which is 2 pi the speed times m which is the speed of rate, um, the crankshaft rotational speed now we said um, brake power here and all the way through this presentation I'll po probably point it out again later but you need to bear in mind that whenever you talk about powers or torques or work you need to be very clear um, where or or how that um, 
power or torque or work is being measured. So the term brake um, typically refers to the power or torque that's being um, applied at the output of the engine. But it could be in the cylinder or it could be to the wheels. So you need to just be very clear about um, which power you're talking about because obviously it will vary as you go through the engine um, depending on losses etc. So anyway, um, in this instance we are talking about um, the brake power um, on the dyno and um, so as I said that's equal to 2 pi um, rotational speed times torque. Now um, this this is written in um, SI units so the, the uh, rotational speed should be in revolutions per second. However, um, in the literature, um, power and torque are normally expressed in more user-friendly units. Uh, so power is usually expressed in um, sort of metric kilowatts or imperial horsepower, which you've probably heard of, obviously heard of. Um, and torque is expressed in, say, the um, metric units, newton meters, or um, pounds force per feet times feet. So, therefore, we can either we can write this two ways. We can say that the brake power in kilowatts is equal to two pi speed of the engine in revs per second um, times by um, newton meters, um, all divided by a thousand. Um, or we can say that the um, the power in horsepower is equal to the speed of the engine in revs per minute times the torque in um, pounds pounds force times feet, all divided by five fifty two fifty two. So therefore, it follows that one um, kilowatt of brake power is one point three. Four ish um, horsepower or one kilowatt. So, sorry, one horsepower is about three quarters of a, of a kilowatt in terms of brake power. Okay, so um, that was the brake power that is measured at the output on the dyno. But as I just said, you can measure, you can, um, measure power um, anywhere in the engine really. So going to talk about what's going on in the cylinder. So on the right over here I've got a PV diagram for a realistic engine. So if you remember it's a, um, so this is a full stroke auto engine. So start um, at the top of the induction stroke, sorry the compression stroke. So you go from 1 to 2, it's compressed, um, fuel is ignited, instantaneous rise in pressure, you get your power stroke, your exhaust stroke and your induction stroke. Now I've shaded the different areas here because um, if you remember from the, the gas exchange lecture the, the blue one here that's the pumping work that's the work that needs to be done to the gas exchange process and the red area is where you're basically generating power work is being done on the piston. So in this instance we can talk about the net so um, the net indicated work per cycle is um, the work that's delivered to the piston over the whole cycle. <clears throat> so in the same way they talk about net profit, it's you know it's how much money um, you you have in your till minus the amount of minus the expenses for your business is the net profit. It's what you're left over with after all deductions have been made. So applying that here, the net work that is done on the engine is the um, the work that's delivered to the piston over the whole cycle. So that is the power or work that's gained. So work can be written as, um, so it's pressure times um, the integration of pressure times change in volume. So don't really worry about this mathematical term here. All this is telling you is that the, 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 um, the network, so the work in the cylinder, um, the work per cylinder in the indicated net, so that's the nomenclature there, is equal to um, 
the area under the curve basically that's what that's saying between one to three to four to five to one so one to two to three to four to five to one okay and that's all that's saying so it's net so as far as um we're concerned it's the red the, um the red minus the blue however the the gross indicated um work per cycle is the work um delivered to the piston just over the compression um, and expansion strokes only i.e the red so this is the so for an ideal um cycle so with no pumping losses so if this blue is zero that then the net would be kind of equal the gross um so that is just the work that's done between one to three to four to one okay so that's just that's the the, the gross and finally the pumping is the difference then um the gross minus the net so and the pumping work is the work between the piston and the cylinder as gases are um inducted and exhausted out of the cylinder <coughs> So that is um, the the, um, the area under the curve between uh, one to four to five to one. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if we've got to work, we can convert that into a power um, this way. So the the power is equal to the work um, times the speed divided by n r. Now. NR here, this is um, basically saying this is the number of revolutions per power stroke. So for a four stroke, we only get one, um, so it's two because we've got two revolutions of the crankshaft per power stroke, and for a two stroke, it's one because you have one power stroke per revolution of the crankshaft. Okay. <clears throat> so then again, be careful of you, your units. So um, power, if that's in watts, then your um, work needs to be in joules, and your revolution, your speed needs to be in revolutions per second. And obviously, this is just um, an integer. So <clears throat> we said that. Um, on the previous slide that we can work out the um, the net work or net power um, or the gross power or gross work but that will vary um, depending on um, different engine designs and different engine geometries so one parameter that's been um, that's commonly used to so that you can make comparisons between engines is the mean effective pressure so <clears throat> the mean effective pressure, as I said, allows comparison of the work done, um, but it's independent of the cylinder volume. And the way that that's calculated is your mean effective pressure, your MEP, is the work per cycle in this instance, um, divided by the sweat volume um, per cycle. So WC over D. Um, and one way of thinking of it is what you're basically saying is you, you, if you've got um if you took uh so on for the um the red curve or you, you've got a change of pressure with volume all the way up so what it's basically saying is if you were to just divide by the volume then how big would that box have to be so the idea is is the area in this box for the mean effective pressure is the same as the area the red area that's shown here yeah so um is say so it's mean effective pressure so if you were to have the the same pressure over the whole volume that would give you the same work as going around the the real cycle that that's the idea of it so it's but then you're independent of the vo the, the volume um so if we the so from the previous slide we said that the MEP now I've just written it MEP we could use the brake mean effective pressure we'll be using the brake work or the indicated mean effective pressure we'll be using the indicated work. Again, you, as I said at the start of the lecture, you need to be clear about which which one you're using. So if we substitute in 
power is um, work time speed over R, then we get to say that the mean effective pressure is either the work over the volume displaced, or that can be also be expressed as the um, because it's sometimes quite hard to um, measure work from an engine, but we can measure power on a dyno, dyno as we talked about. So is it can be expressed as power times um, if you remember this is the number of revolutions per power stroke all divided by the displaced and the speed and again be careful of units so this is a, a common um, method of it of how it's expressed so we've got more f friendly um, units so the MEP expressed in kilopascals is equal to the um, power kilowatts times by um, two for a four stroke times by a thousand divided by the volume in decimeters um, which is liters basically times by the uh, speed the engine speed in revolutions per second okay so as I kind of uh, hinted out on the previous slide so the mean effective pressure is defined by the location um, or method so if we're measuring it on a dyno and we've got our um, brake power, then we're looking at the brake mean effective pressure because um, it's being calculated from the brake torque. Um, if we can um, get very accurate measurement of the, the pressure within the cylinder um, using instrumentation, then we can get an indication of the, the gross uh, uh, indicated uh, mean effective pressure and this relates to the in-cylinder pressure from the um, compression and expansion strokes only if you remember from that we could get the net um, indicated mean effective pressure and the, this really if you remember this relates to the in-cylinder power um, over the complete engine cycle and the difference of those two is the pumping mean effective pressure and so this is the um, uh, the work that's required to move the gas in and out of the cylinder but expressed as a, as a um, mean pressure and also we have the um, friction um, mean effective pressure so this relates to so this isn't kind of a little bit strange expressing this as a pressure but basically it's um, uh, relates to the theoretical effect of pressure that you need that you need to overcome the friction in the engine and FMEP basically has got PMEP wrapped up in it okay so that was mean effective pressure so we're just going to talk about some of the other um, metrics that we've got now so uh, mechanical efficiency is another good way of describing it and this is a ratio of the useful power so typically brake power that you've got to the indicated power um, you know what you should have based on your um, indicator diagrams from the engine so so the way that that's expressed is um, the mechanical efficiency is PBO um, the indicated and so something I should have said earlier the indicated power indicated work the normal convention is that when you're talking about indicated you're referring to the gross rather than to the net unless otherwise stated but it's always a good idea to state it clearly um, just just to be 100% sure about which, which indicated power you, you're talking about um, <clears throat> so as I say it's you get but that can also um, power can be expressed as BMEP and the uh, indicated power can be expressed as IMEP and <clears throat> the BMP can be written as um, IMEP minus the friction mean effective pressure so that whole expression can be written rewritten like this as well um, mechanical efficiency is usually in the range of 75 to 90 percent um, but that does depend on throttle position so at wide open throttle you'll have a mechanical efficiency in the order of 90 percent and then is um, the engine's throttle that reduces down to eventually it's zero when it's idling 
Okay, the specific fuel consumption. Um, this is quite an important one. It's a measure of how efficiently the engine is using the fuel um, that's supplied to produce the work. So this is obviously important from the, the customer's point of view. Um, this is going to sort of tell them how much it's going to cost to run their, their engine over at certain their loads and speeds. So uh, the way it's defined is it's a fuel mass flow per unit power. So the specific fuel consumption, so SFC, and again, as with any of these parameters, that, that should be expressed depending on which power you're using. So if you're using the brake power, this is a brake specific fuel consumption. It's the indicated power, this should be the indicated specific fuel consumption, etc. So as I say, the mass flow rate um, divided um, by the by the power that you you're um, that you're measuring. Um, Again, you need to check units. A lot of funny units are used, um, are being used throughout this lecture, but it's purely just because, <clears throat> in terms of um, the engine design and how you use these things, you don't want to be always be expressing the power in watts, where you 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 know you've got a um, hundred thousand, you know watts. It's much easier just to say a hundred kilowatts, um, for example. So. The word, common way of expressing this is in milligrams per joule. So that's basically grams per second of mass flow rate, which is an easy, <clears throat> nice, easy quantity to measure and um, the power in kilowatts. Okay, so the fuel um, conversion efficiency. So this is um, slightly different to the, the one on the previous slide. So rather than saying it's the um mass of fuel per unit power you're saying that this is the the fuel um conversion efficiency is the work produced per cycle divided by the fuel energy supplied per cycle so basically it's how you're um taking the um the energy from the fuel and actually transferring that into useful work <clears throat> so the um, fuel um, conversion efficiency is the, as I say, the work um, per cylinder, let's say, divided by the mass of fuel um, times by um, QHV. Now the QHV is the heating value of the fuel, so that's basically energy per unit mass. So you've got energy per unit mass times mass, so that gives you the, the energy that you're supplying. Um, but again, we, these can all kind of be um, rewritten, so um, the work can be re rewritten as um, power over speed, and um, the mass can be written as a function of mass flow rate and speed, and eventually if you um, reduce that down, you find out that the um, fuel conversion efficiency, efficiency is effectively one over the specific fuel consumption, which makes sense. Okay, the, the volumetric efficiency. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because this was um, covered in the gas exchange lecture um, in a m bit more depth there. But essentially, the volumetric efficiency is a ratio of the amount of air that you can get into your engine divided by theoretically how much air you can get into that engine. So it, we, we we talked about the the fact that um, getting air into the engine is one of the the um, is one of the limiting factors of engine um, design. It's fairly easy to get the fuel in there. It's a liquid. You can just squirt in as much as you want. But to get in lots of air to combust that fuel, that that's the challenge really. And so that the the volumetric efficiency um, effectively is it measures that. So just just to re reiterate, so it's the the mass of air that you, is in you, that you can get into your cylinder divided by theoretically how much air um, you should be able to get into that. And it's normally in the for nas naturally aspirated engines around eighty to ninety percent. But just to remind you. Um, for turbocharged engines, the efficiency can be greater than 100% because the mass of air that you're getting into the cylinder is um, higher than 
the theoretical and that's because your theoretical mass is taken at atmospheric conditions not at effectively elevated pressures which you have um, for a turbocharged engine okay so this plot here shows how the variation of these parameters um, changes with speed so I'm just going to talk through th through this a little bit so on the bottom here we've got um, engine speed going from left to right and going from bottom to top we've got um, each of the, the various parameters so we on here we're showing um, torque of the engine the indicated gross um, the um, power the brake power the friction power <clears throat> we're also showing um, mechanical efficiency and brake specific fuel consumption okay so I'm going to start off with torque um, torque uh, this basically follows um, the volumetric efficiency curve so if I were to show you um, engine speed versus volumetric efficiency this would follow the same um, curve because as I mentioned a few slides back or the previous slide it is it is the air that's the limiting factor in this engine that getting it in that that's that that's the issue so the the torque um, curve um, follows that so that is basically related to volumetric efficiency now the indicated power or the power that basically follows the torque curve but if you look at the equation um, you've got speed in there so it doesn't follow exactly the, um, so this is related to the torque um, so this increases with increasing speed and eventually if you kept going this would start to come down again um, <clears throat> and then the way that these are obviously related is the brake power is the indicated power minus the friction power and the reason that these two curves start to diverge away from each other <clears throat> is because as you increase the engine speed um, you have more fr friction so therefore the friction power increases so, so something I should just say here is power work and mean effect pressure all kind of you, you can think of them as almost interchangeable quantities in this um, in this context so when I say um, friction power which you know might might seem counterintuitive I'm really saying friction work but because it work can be expressed as a power I can say friction power <clears throat> so as the friction work or friction power in increases then the um, brake power starts to deviate more away from the indicated power okay <clears throat> um, because the friction power increases with engine speed that also means that the mechanical efficiency goes down so if you remember the mechanical efficiency is the useful work that I can get out um, divided by what I what I should be able to get out um, so that so that decreases with engine speed um, because my friction is increasing and consequently as well my brake um, specific fuel consumption is going in so the amount of power that I can extract for a unit fuel is going up because <clears throat> I'm losing a lot of it now to friction rather than to generate the power okay so what I showed you on the previous slide is um, that was just for um, wide open throttle or just for one throttle position but obviously for an engine you don't just drive around at one throttle position you, um, you're changing it as you go so what this shows is this is an engine performance map and I've plotted um, engine speed or more commonly you might see piston speed plotted against the bottom because again piston speed kind of takes out the, the the geometry of the engine so you can compare light for light directly um, but you could see either and uh, on the uh, the y-axis I've got brake mean effective pressure and 
what you're seeing in the middle, these kind of islands are these are lines of these ISO lines are lines of constant break specific fuel consumption. So green, um, which is this island here, is the most efficient. And <clears throat> as it increases, then your brake specific fuel consumption goes up, so the efficiency of your engine is going is going um down. That's all constrained by this line at the top, which is this WOT is wide open throttle, so you can't go above this line because you can't get any more air into the engine, so um that's your limiting factor on the top. Okay, so I'm just going to talk around this. So you can see quite clearly that the um, your most efficient um, uh, engine uh, op operation is kind of in the middle here. So it's re really the aim of uh, a good engine designer is if you can end up with your, um, you know, your, the, say just say this area here that I've just drawn on here. If that was the area where your customer is going to um, spend most of their time driving, so they're going to be running at you know, these kind of engine speeds and at these kind of loads, then they're going to be operating in the most efficient part of your engine. Okay, so that's, that's going to be better for them. Whereas if you find that actually, I don't know, they're down here, so they're always running at all these high engine speeds, but fairly low loads then that's not good because if they're in here then they've got their um <clears throat> their brake specific fuel consumption is really high in this region compared to over here so it's really the aim and the challenge of the engine designer to <clears throat> make sure that this well the design of the engine <clears throat> excuse me and consequently the engine performance map that they get is as closely aligned to the driving styles or the the average driving style of the vehicle that they're designing the engine for, so that they can make sure that the um, the the engine is operating in its most efficient um, area as as often as it, as often as it can. Okay, so. I'm just going to talk through this because you're probably asking yourself, you know, why is it, um, why is uh, the most efficient area in the middle here and not up at this line or this line? So, yeah, I'm just going to talk through this. So, the wide open throttle line at the top, as I talked about, that's constrained by the volumetric efficiency. Okay. So, if I just consider we're operating in this regime at the minute. So it's right slap bang in the middle of the most efficient island of, of our operator. So we're running at this load and this engine speed. Okay. Now if I keep the engine speed the same but I increase load then the bre brake specific fuel consumption goes up. Now the reason that it goes up is because um, it's air limited, so I can't get any more air into my engine because I'm running at the same speed. So I can add more fuel um, to get more power, but obviously that means that my brake specific fuel consumption goes up. Likewise, if I um, head south at this point, then my brake specific, brake specific fuel consumption goes up. Now the reason that this goes up is because um, I'm decreasing load as I go from this point, so kind of um, power isn't the issue here. But what is the issue is that as I'm kind of going south at this point, it's the importance of the friction mean effect of pressure. As soon as you start kind of going to low loads or low speeds, the, the friction is kind of becoming the dominant um the dominant um, forces, not not forces, the dominant power in the engine. So that means that kind of per unit power, your um, fuel consumption is going up. If I head east of here, again the the fuel consumption goes up, and the reason for that is, if you remember from the um, on the previous slide, 
the fuel, the friction is going up as we increase engine speed. So it's the same load. It's the same load, increasing, uh, but we're increasing engine speed. So the friction power goes up and mechanical efficiency goes down. Therefore, per unit power, we need um, more fuel. And <laughs> likewise, if we go the other way, the go head west. Now the fuel, uh, sorry, the friction um, mean effective pressure goes down, um, but um, it goes down. But what's happening here is the importance of heat transfer is increasing. So if you remember at low engine loads, <coughs> the transient, <coughs> sorry, the transit time is, or um, residence time is a lot higher. So heat transfer is much more of an issue at lower engine speeds. And so that's why the um, brake specific fuel consumption increases as he heads west on that plot. Okay, um, I don't um, expect you to um, write this down or really remember it, but I just want you to just follow this bit of derivation that I'm going to do now. So we've talked about um, power and torque. Um, mean effective pressure but also other some of the other quantities such as um, mechanical efficiency volumetric efficiency and fuel um, conversion efficiency so let's just start off with power so power is work um, time speed basically now if we substitute in the thermal conversion efficiency so we rewrite this for work and substitute it in there we end up with saying power is a function of the fuel, sorry, thermal um, conversion efficiency times speed. Now we've got the mass of fuel in here. Okay, well, let's substitute in our fuel to area ratio. So um, mass of fuel over mass of air. And we get now have the power is a function of. Um, uh, fuel conversion efficiency and the fuel to air ratio and so we can now let's substitute in the volumetric efficiency and it seems a bit tedious to, but just bear with me so we what we're doing is we're starting off with power and we're just working through substituting in a lot of the metrics that we talked about so now if we put in the volumetric efficiency so because we, um, we've got mass of air in here. Um, so we, we now can say that power is, we now get to this relationship where power is a function of thermal conversion efficiency, the volumetric efficiency, density of the air, volume of the engine, the fuel to air ratio, heating value of the, the, um, the, the, the fuel and the engine speed. So, just carry that over onto the next slide. Now, again, this is the volume of the engine, um, which is obviously dependent for each engine. So one way we can kind of try and uh, non-dimensionalize that is, not non-dimensionalize it, but make it comparable, is we can talk about the specific power. Now this, we can say the specific power is a power per unit area of the piston. Okay, so we're going to divide three by the area of the piston. So that we're between engines, we can say it doesn't matter what the bore is. Um, it's how much power you can deliver per unit area of the piston. Okay, so we end up with this expression. So we've got the, um, uh, so now the, the volume becomes the stroke. And we can also replace that by to putting in, um, mean piston speed. So the mean piston speed is uh, related to the stroke and the speed of the engine. So eventually we end up with this relationship here. Now, as I say, I don't expect you to, to follow this. I mean, please just go through it so you un understand um, what I've done. But basically, I just wanted to show you that because you eventually end up to this, ex this expression. And it might seem... Um, intuitive what I'm about to say next but I just wanted to show you that we've kind of got here by a more by kind of like a rigorous um, method so 
what it's saying is that the specific power for your engine is related to, to this function. Now, what it's telling you is, okay, if you want more power or more specific power, you need to increase the fuel um, conversion efficiency of your engine. I know it seems obvious, but again, just think I've, I've demonstrated this to you in a good way. Also, if you want to increase power, you need to increase your volumetric efficiency. You need to increase the density of your air. You need to increase the piston um, speed. You need to increase your fuel to air ratio. And also, you can increase um, the fuel heating value. So, increasing any of these parameters will give you, give you um, more power uh, per unit area of your piston. So, this is what I really wanted to kind of drive home and, and finish on is that. You know, by increasing any of these parameters will give you a better engine. I mean, obviously there are limitations. I mean, as we know from the combustion thing, if you start increasing the fuel to air ratio, eventually you, uh, run into problems with the stability of your combustion, and you can't increase your piston speed indefinitely because you're going to start reaching the um, the the uh, limits of the material in terms of its stress and um, uh, deformation, etc. So obviously there are limitations, but essentially, you know, if you can increase all these parameters as far as you can, then you're on, you're on the road to good engine design. Okay, so in this lecture, I hope um, you now know the the main engine performance metrics um, that are used to to um, characterize engine performance, how they're used. Um, and also how they vary with engine conditions. So whether you've got more load, less load, um, going faster or slower, and also what what is the um, what are the driving factors for a good engine design? Okay, thank you very much for to listening. For um, well, not just this lecture, but all the lectures, and say my contact details are here if you want to have any comments queries want to talk to me about anything in this lecture then please let me know or come and see me and thank you very much for listening